Hello, Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. It's my joy and honor to bring God's word to you at this time and also in this season of life, wherever you may be. Um, today, we're looking at Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. And the title is The Day of Rejoicing. Uh, just to once again give kind of a broad view of what we're doing here. Uh, as a church, we're reading the Bible together. Uh, and hopefully, I hope that you're up to date. And if you're not, then perhaps studying uh, with the New Testament coming in this week that might be a good idea. Uh, but we're finishing up actually Old Testament today in terms of sermon uh, with Zephaniah. Uh, there are a few more books after, but uh, this is where we'll end. Uh, just to give you a very brief uh, uh, background for Zephaniah, uh, he was a prophet to Judah during the reign of Josiah. Uh, that's about uh, 640 to 609 BC. Uh, we don't know exactly when, uh, but he, he was prophesying uh, about this day of the Lord, uh, this day of the Lord. And then if you look at the outline uh, provided to you in the description, uh, it actually is divided into three parts. First, chapter 1, verse 1, through uh, chapter 2, verse 3 is an introduction uh, and judgment against Judah and the world on the day of the Lord. So this uh, God's wrath coming upon uh, Judah and the world. And then second part, chapter 2, verse 4, to chapter 3, verse 8, is judgment against nations and also Judah in chapter 3, and the same day, that the day of the Lord. And then last part, the part that we'll be looking at today, uh, chapter 3, verse 9 through 20, is actually salvation for God's people on the day of the Lord. Uh, so with that said, at this time, let us God, uh, go to God in prayer, and then uh, we'll hear God's word together. Let us pray. Children, that means close your eyes. I know it's, uh, it's a little bit awkward, but close your eyes and pray with me. Uh, God, we thank you for uh, your word that which sustains us week by week. Day by day, uh, as the Spirit truly makes this truth to be ours, uh, the truth about you and about us and about the day, this day to come, it gives us hope to sustain us. And not only that, but faith that really helps us to live as your people now. And God, may we, uh, in light of the passage we look at today, may we become people that rejoices despite all the circumstances, and also despite our sin, because of what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. We thank you. Bless us this time together for the, all those who are listening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll be reading uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. 14 through 20. People of God, the grass withers, the flower fades. The word of the Lord will stand forever. This is God's word. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day he shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts. And I will change the sh their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time when I gather you together, for I will make you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, by the time this uh, uh, sermon is actually published, uh, I I will have the chance to attend a wedding. Uh, actually, uh, somewhat unusual, especially during this time. Uh, but you know, the wedding day is it's a day when uh, really it's excitement, joy, and happiness. Uh, and then people say it's the happiest day of your life. 
Uh, you, you gather all your loved ones, and then you, uh, that day you start the first day for the rest of your life. Spend it together with your spouse. And although it is stressful, anxious to prepare, but it is worth it all that truly start the marriage. Singing, there's, uh, there's happiness all around. But what if? Just imagine, what if that day actually becomes the worst day of your life? Day when you experience the worst things. Well, you wouldn't want to join. You wouldn't want to go. The day, the, it, either it can be perhaps the happy, happiest day or the worst day. You wait for that day. What if you didn't know? What if you didn't know that it was going to be happy or the worst? Well, in, in, in the book of Zephaniah, we actually see that the day is again and again mentioned, the day of the Lord. And then even as you're listening, at that time, is you know, brought up again and again. Well, that's because this day of the Lord, as, you know, as, as we will look at in chapter 1, 2, and in the beginning part of 3, is a day to be feared. It's a day that you don't want to come. But for the people of God, it's the best day. It's the day that we're waiting for. It will be truly the day that it's full of joy and excitement. And one commentator actually put it this way, where in this part of Zephaniah is perhaps one of the most awesome description of the wrath of God in judgment found in anywhere in the scripture. But at the same time, in the same book, we see one of the most moving description of the love of God for his people found anywhere in the scripture. And then that person actually goes on to say here, Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 is perhaps regarded as John 3 16 of the Old Testament. For it is such a moving words describing God's love for his people. So what we see is that this day of the Lord is double-sided. It's a day of judgment for those who refuse to trust in God. But it's a day of rejoicing for his people. So with that said, the main point is that because God rejoices over us in Jesus Christ, we can rejoice in him now, despite our circumstances and despite our sin. And even on the day of the Lord. Let me say it again. Because God rejoices over us in Jesus Christ, we can rejoice in him now and on the day of the Lord. And we look at this in two points. First, a call to rejoice. And second, a God who rejoices over us. So call to rejoice. And second, a God who rejoices over us. First, a call to rejoice. Four times in verse 14, and with three different names, God's people are called to rejoice. And this shows something that you can help but, you know, express in excitement and joy. And like the one that David showed when he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And this passage sounds very uplifting and hopeful and, and joyful. But we, we, we wouldn't see the full force of that joy unless we consider the rest of Zephaniah. How does Zephaniah get here? Well, if you look at Zephaniah chapter 1, 2, and up to chapter 3, verse 8, it is describing, once again, I mentioned the day of the Lord coming as the day of cosmic and total judgment against a sin. And in fact, in chapter 1, in the beginning part, we see alluding to creation account. And that shows that this judgment won't be just against the people, but it will be something that includes all creation. Entire earth and humankind will be consumed by God's wrath against sinners. And we see that in chapter 3, verse 8, where he, he gathers nations and he says, I will pour out with my burning anger, and then all the earth shall be consumed. His anger, his wrath will be poured out against 
sinners who commit idolatry, injustice, who are rebellious, who are refusing to trust in the Lord. Well, then how do we get from that cosmic total judgment to this rejoicing? Well, on that day, the day when God will pour out his wrath, God will also save and show his blessing, his love. And we said in verse 9 through 13, there's, God says, I will change their speech to call upon the Lord and serve him, to, to find refuge in him. And then here, the, the word seeking refuge is not just waiting and passive trusting, but is actually actively seeking God as their trust, that God will remove the proud, that he will purge out evil, and then only the humble will remain. And I hear, how does God do that? And we sit in verse 15. Look at verse 15 with me. It says, the Lord has taken away the judgment against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. God is providing the basis for rejoicing here. How can we, why can we rejoice He's saying, because God is with us. And, and that God is for us and not against us. The threat was not sin or death, but it was God himself coming in wrath. But God says, I'm in your midst, not to judge, not to bring down curse, but I'm for you. That we're no longer enemies, but God has defeated our enemies. The fear of the Lord is restored, but the fear of judgment is gone. For God has taken away judgment away from us. But one thing that Zephaniah doesn't tell us is how God actually does that. But we know that this passage is actually fulfilled in pointing to Christ. How do we know? The Son of God that that God sent, his names were what? Emmanuel, God with us. But not only that, his name was also Jesus, God saves. He is with us and he is for us. That in his death, he has taken our judgments away. The judgments that we deserve was upon him. And through his resurrection, he has cleared away our enemies. Sin, death, and Satan himself. For those who know and believe this, what should we do then? Knowing this and believing in this and trusting in Jesus, what should we do? And that's why God calls us to rejoice. Rejoice for God is for us and not against us in Jesus Christ. Rejoice for you are justified and being sanctified in Christ. Rejoice for one day, the, on the day of the Lord, we will be glorified. And that day is not the day of judgment, but the day of the ultimate goal being fulfilled, which is to be with God, and he is with us, and we are with him. The day is the day of rejoicing. Okay, you can say that day is that day, but how about now? Where is the rejoicing now, especially now? There is much to rejoice about these days. Hey, we are easy to be, it's easy for us to become despair and also become apathetic and even cynical. There's little motivation to sing aloud at home when, when praise feels less inspiring, we're touching, we're moving. It's not the same, you may say. Yeah, rejoicing. As we see in the scripture, it doesn't depend on our ever-changing circumstances or ever-changing emotions, but our rejoicing is grounded in ever-faithful God who loved us in Jesus Christ and what he has done in him. So we don't need to wait for Christmas to come around to get in the mood for singing even now at home, even now as you, as you see, as you hear, we can sing aloud and rejoice. 
Even now as we see around and there's not much to rejoice about. Even now as we see ourselves, the sin in us, when we don't feel all that great. We can rejoice because of God, not us, because of God. Even when it seems like there isn't much to hope for, we can rejoice. We are called to rejoice as we remember and as we look forward to what God has done for us. But not only that, what we see is that we actually have a God who rejoices over us. And that's our second point. We have a call to rejoice, but at the same time, we have a God who rejoices over us. And that's our second point. And this comes as a surprise because, yeah, we can expect the Bible to tell us to rejoice. And that's what we hear even in Philippians chapter 4 from Paul. But what we see is a God who promises to rejoice over us. Look at verse 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. What kind of God do we see here? A God who is with his people, who is for his people, like a warrior who will come and save his people, like a husband who is over the hills for his people, and like a father who will protect his people. Here the word for love is actually not hesed, the covenant faithful love, but it's actually hava, which is used for, in the Bible, Husbands love for wife, wives love for husband, and even in used in friendship. And then a love that is used to uh, de- describe the delight in God's law. And then finally in Hosea, describing God's own love for his people. And so we might think that the God in the Old Testament is a God who's holy, righteous, and a God of wrath who is scary and angry. And then perhaps the God of the New Testament is a loving God in Jesus. But this shows that the God in the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament who so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Loving God. But the thing is, this love is shown to what kind of people we see. It's shown to, in verse 19, the, lo- the lame and the outcast. Not to the strong, not to the proud, not to the victims, but to the lame and outcast. Who know that they themselves are helpless or humble enough to come before God and ask for help. And he says he will bring praise in the place of shame and honor for people among all the peoples. And notice the phrase, he, again and again, he says, he will, he will. And then verse 18 through 20 is, I will, I will. God is making him a promise to this kind of people. God is not away, but he is with us. And then this kind of love is for those who don't deserve it. If you remember a picture from Hosea, Gomer was the picture of someone who did not deserve to be loved, who ran away and came back. It was, it was God's people at their worst. But then here we see God's love shown to that kind of people. And God says, I will quiet you with my love. You can imagine a loving father knowing that the child is scared. The father holds the child closely in his arms, close to his chest, so that the child can hear the heartbeat of the father to come the child and then hums and sings so the child can know that he or she in the hands of a safe, safe hands of the Father. 
There's no more fear. That's kind of the picture we see of the God. Is that the kind of picture that you have of God, even in the Old Testament? The kind of God who's so loving, who did not simply describe the word, describe his love in the words, but then sent the word of God in flesh, Jesus Christ, who came and then who actually Join the praise. It wasn't just in love in words, but he acted in concrete action of sending his son, Jesus Christ. And then his son, and he came, he wasn't simply away, and he, he didn't, he, he came into the world, and he suffered. He, he was cursed. It wasn't easy for him. He truly understands what it means for us to be in this world, but to not be of it. To know what it means to go through the punishment of sin, and yet was triumphant. In all that, he remained rejoicing. In, 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 in despite all that, he remained praiseful. And that's what we see in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. Let me read it for us. Hebrews 2, chapter 12, you can turn with me. Quoting from Psalm 22, verse 22, it says this, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And then later on in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the author of the Hebrews writes, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. It wasn't easy, and yet he remained rejoicing. He praised God. You see, the reason to rejoice for us, the reason to rejoice in what God has done for us and not in, not in us. And God does this not because he has to, because he is that kind of God, loving, steadfast in love for his people. And if you're saying, you know, Pastor Sung, that just sounds too good to be true. And if that's the case, that we need to understand the gospel better and deeper because that's kind of God that the scripture shows to us. And as people who go through, and as, as a person who go through the same thing, I understand it's not easy because the world is still a hard place to live in, that we still struggle with sin. And pain we still experience. And injustice we still witness in the world. But what we see now is not the end of the story. Coronavirus is not the end of the story. Unrest, brokenness, shame, pain, and injustice, they're all real, but they're not the end of the story. And that's what Zephaniah shows us. That here what we see is the gospel truly frees us and strengthens us to rejoice and sing despite our circumstances and despite our sin. That we can sing the song of truth that will sustain us, that will encourage us, that will help us to express our frustration in the experience that we have in this world, that will help us to work our own hearts and help us to move forward and endure what we experience and when there is no strength in us. For our rejoicing is in God who rejoices over us. The way the Bible ends is actually with a wedding between God and his people. In that, on that final day, what we see is the wedding, that the marriage supper of the Lamb, where, where people are rejoicing and singing praise to God. And that's what we see. The preview, the preview is what we see here. And it is helping people to look forward to that day 
when the, when the day of rejoicing. But the thing is, Zephaniah and the Israelites did not get to see that day. They trusted in the Savior to come in the future. But for us, where we would trust in the Savior that came, and one day, along with the Old Testament saints, we're looking forward to that day when he will come back, on that day of the wedding, for the day of the marriage supper of the Lamb, the day of rejoicing, final rejoicing. And we're waiting for the day with hope, the hope of new creation, the hope of where we're being made renewed, where we're remade in the image of Christ in holiness and righteousness. But for now, but for now, first we long to gather together to sing praise and rejoice in the Lord in the same building. We can't even do that now, but we look forward to that day. But more than that, we long to see that final day where we will join with all the saints, with from all the nations, praise and rejoice in God forever and ever. Never get tired of it. Seeing what the work that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. We long, that, we long for the day of the Lord. But until then, we can rejoice now, wherever we are, especially on Sunday when we gather for worship. The people of God continue to rejoice in him, continue to sing praises, knowing that we're waiting for that day, the day of rejoicing. Let us pray together. God, help us to rejoice now, despite what we go through, despite what we see, despite our own hearts that are still sinning, despite the pains that we cause and we experience, despite our own emotions that's unstable, despite the fact that we lose trust and we don't see much hope around, God, we pray that we remain rejoicing for who you are and what you had done for us in Jesus Christ. But God, we look forward to that day when our rejoicing will be cosmic and with the whole world, from all people from all nations and all tongues, praising you forever and ever. God, but to that day, sustains us, sustain us in our faith that we may remain people of praise. We thank you for Jesus Christ who, who's praising, who's who rejoicing over us for the, for the joy that was set before him, joy of gaining a people for himself. He endured the cross. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We praise you. All the glory and honor unto your name. But in Jesus' name, amen.